Hello everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the common emitter connection, a very simple way of setting up our bipolar junction transistor. This is what we're going to be looking at. Here's our transistor. Got a base resistor over here. Base power supply. This is going to forward bias the base emitter junction collector resistor and a collector power supply which will wind up reverse biasing the collector base junction. All right, so here's VBB. Let's make this 10 volts. Here's the base resistor RB and we'll make this 200 K ohms. The collector resistor will make that 1 K and collector power supply will make 15 volts. So our goal here is to determine various currents and voltages in the circuit. How do we go about doing that? Well, what we're going to do is replace the transistor with our model. Remember, our simplified ebers mole model consists of the diode, a forward bias diode for the base emitter, and a controlled current source up in the collector. All right, so here's our model. Now I'm just going to add everything back in here. All right, there's our 200K, our 10 volt power supply. And then coming off here, we've got our 1K and the 15 volt power supply. All right, now, how do we go from here? Well, we basically have two loops. Right? So we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law in here. If we look at this loop, we have something like this. It will be a drop across the base resistor. It will also be a drop across the base emitter, that uh, forward bias diode, which we know is approximately 0.7 volts for a silicon device. Okay, this end, we're going to get something like this. And this will produce a drop across the resistor. And we know that the value of the current source is equal to beta IB. All right, so this guy is beta IB. What's beta? Well, you know, typically, Small signal transistor might be 100, 150, 200. So let's just say, you know, nice round number. Let's just say it's 100. Okay. Looking at this, we can create a couple of equations. Looking at our first loop, we can say that the base power supply, that's the rise, is going to have to equal the drop across the base resistor, V of RB plus the drop across the base emitter, VBE. We can also say that the collector voltage, that power supply, has to equal the two parts of the resistor, V of RC, and the drop across the transistor, VCE. All right, so here, remember, this is your collector up here, your base and your emitter. Right, that whole thing. We know, we know part of that. Part of that's 0.7, but we don't know the other part. We don't know the drop across the current source. That's a reverse bias junction, so that's up in the air. This one, however, we do, we do have some good ideas. We know VBB, that's 10 volts. We know VBE, that's 0.7. So obviously, the drop across the V of RB has to be VBB minus VBE. That gives us the voltage across this resistor. I can then use Ohm's law to find the current. In other words, IB would have to be the source voltage of VBB minus VBE over RB. All right, so I'm not doing anything fancy here. We're just using basic KVL Ohm's law stuff. So that's 10 volts minus 0.7 divided by 200K. 
And that is going to give us a base current of 46 and a half microamps, right? 9.3 volts divided by 200K. Now the collector current, we know is supposed to be beta times that, right? Beta times IB. So our beta is 100. Forty-six and a half mics, and that is going to give us four point six five milliamps. That's our clue into the second loop. We now know this current, right? That's IC, which immediately allows us to find the voltage across the collector resistor. That's just Ohm's law: IC times RC. So you take your four point six five mils, you multiply it by one k you've got 4.65 volts. The only thing left is VCC, which in this circuit is the same as VC, right? VC would be the drop from collector to ground. The emitter is at ground, so in this particular circuit, VC is the same as VCE, because VE is zero. That's not always the case in all circuits, but it is the case here. So finally, we can say that VC or VCE is simply equal to the power supply, VCC, minus the drop on the collector resistor. So that's 15 minus the 4.65. All right, so that's going to equal 10.35 volts. All right, so that's VCE, or like I said, VC, either one. Okay, now what happens if we go and change the beta? All right, so let's say you put a different transistor in here, and now your beta is twice the size. It's 200. What ends up happening? Well, this loop, right, this initial loop doesn't change. You still have 10 volts. You still have 0.7. You still have 200K. You're still going to get 46 and a half mics. No change. However, because beta has doubled, that means your collector current will have doubled. All right, so I see will wind up going to 9.3 mils. Now notice what happens here. Because that goes up, that means the drop across the collector resistor has to go up. So V of RC is also going to double, right? So from 4.65, that's going to go up to 9.3 volts, or 9.3 mils times 1K. And because of that, the collector voltage is going to go down, because we only have 15 volts to start with. So we see an inverse relation here, All right? So that's going to be 15 volts minus the 9.3, or 5.7 volts. So as the current goes up, the collector emitter voltage goes down. How far can we take this? You know, if you doubled it again, like you said, oh, beta is 400, you would expect this current to double to 18.6. But there's a problem, because if that happens, you would now have 18.6 volts across the collector resistor, which can't be. You only have a 15 volt power supply. Right? Where's the extra voltage coming from? So that doesn't really happen. We have to figure out, you know, sort of like where the ceiling is. Where's, where's the limit? Well, what we do here is we come up with something called a load line. And the load line is going to help us determine all possible operating points for this circuit. Now, I want to look back at this equation here, right? If we break this apart using Ohm's law, VCC, V of RC is IC times RC. Now, remember what we did in the preceding video. We were talking about collector curves. Right, we plotted this thing with VCE and IC. And you might remember that we had you know, a bunch of curves that came up through saturation, went out to breakdown, like this. Right? I'll just put a couple of them out here. This region in here, the flat region, is what we referred to as the linear operating region, which is where we want to operate. Right? This is breakdown out here. This skinny little area in here is, is saturation. Okay, if I look at this equation, and I write it in slope-intercept form, in other words, y equals mx plus b form, 
right? The y, the vertical, is ic. So if I just do a little algebra on here, we find out that ic is going to equal a negative 1 over rc plus bcc over rc. Right? So this is 1 over rc is the slope, negative 1 over rc. So it's negative, so I know it's going this way. Um, vcc over rc is a constant. That is the y-intercept. That's the, the value that we wind up over here where our line crosses. Okay, so if you plot this line, you get something that goes like this. Now up here, like I said, this is the intercept. This is VCC over RC. We call this current the saturation current, IC sat. Now, it's important to remember this is not a function of the transistor. This is not something you would look up on a data sheet. This is a function of the circuit, right? the circuit elements, power supplies, resistors, and so forth. Now, the x-intercept over here, we refer to this as the cutoff voltage, VCE cutoff. We call it cutoff because that's where the current cuts off, where it goes to zero. If you plug zero into this equation, right, what do you get? What value do you wind up with? Okay. Oh, I've forgot my VCE in here. Sorry about that. That's the slope times VCE. Um, so, you know, where, where do we get uh, a value for VCE that satisfies IC is equal to zero? Well, that's got to be VCC. Okay. Now I'm going to copy this back down because that's not the cutest looking thing. So there's no equal, you know, confusion about what I'm really writing here. All right. So my X and Y values. So slope, intercept. In any case, so if I set IC to zero, VCE would have to equal VCC. That's this value here. That's the load line. In other words, no matter what beta I choose, the current voltage characteristic that we come up with, that pair of numbers, has to lie on this line, right? Obviously, if we're over here, way up here, we're in saturation. That creates a limit. Each one of these operating points we call a Q point or a quiescent point. That's where the circuit is operating. Um, when we look at AC analysis, we'll actually see this, the currents and voltages varying around the Q point. But Q stands for quiescent. All right, so in our particular circuit, our example up here, this is what we wind up with. Our cutoff voltage is VCC, that's 15 volts. Our saturation is VCC over RC, which is going to be 15 volts over 1K. There's an easy way to remember this. You know, what you're really saying is, if I brought the current, um, excuse me, if I brought the VCE to zero, what do I get? Well, if this is zero, all of this voltage has to drop across that resistor. Bingo. And of course, the flip is also true. If you said, well, if the current goes to zero, um, you know, what do I have for VCE? Well, if the current's zero, there's no drop on this. So all of this power supply has to drop on the transistor. So we've, we've got our load line. Um, our first Q with the beta of 100, we came up with 4.65 mils, or about a third of this. So here we are, 4.65 mils. And we came up with a, a VCE of 10.35. All right, so notice we're about, not quite a third of the way up, and we're a little over two-thirds of the way over. So I'm just going to call that Q1. That's the beta of 100. Then when we did it for a doubling of beta, right, we'll call that Q2, current jumped up to 9.3 mils, which, you know, if that's 15, that's going to be up here somewhere. And, you know, the voltage dropped down to 5.7. Right, so... Q2. Now, in our case, if we, um, you know, double it again, if we went to 400, 
the sort of naive calculation would be, well, everything doubles up again, we get 18.6. No, 18.6 is off here, it's off the load line. So this circuit's in saturation. If you ever come up with something that's bigger than the saturation current, the circuit's in saturation. That's the end of it. Now, if you're saying, hey, um, you know, what about my beta? You know, I mean, if I actually have a beta of 400, I mean, what happened to that beta? Well, when you go into saturation, the beta basically collapses. So when we spec, hey, beta is 100, beta is 200, we're assuming the circuit is operating in this linear region, in this area here. Right? We're not assuming it's in breakdown. We're not assuming it's in saturation. Um, if the circuit does go into saturation, forget about it. You can't assume the beta of 100 that assumed linear operation. So again, if you ever come up with a current that's bigger than your saturation current, the circuit is in saturation. And in our case, you know, that sets the ceiling of 15 mils. It is in fact a smidge less than that because your uh, VCE sat is not really zero. Um, if you look at a data sheet, you can determine precise values of the saturation voltage for specific values of current, uh, you know, collector current and so forth. Um, a good rule of thumb, maybe a tenth of a volt, you know? I mean, it could be a little bit more, it could be a little less, but, you know, as a rule of thumb, maybe a tenth of a volt. But, you know, very often we just assume it's zero and, and we kind of run with that just to get an idea of, of where the circuit is, okay? All right, so in the future, what we're going to do is when we create circuits, we're going to be creating load lines, and load lines are unique to the circuit topology. So if I set things up differently, um, yeah, we're still going to have a saturation on a cutoff, but how we calculate them might change. In other words, it might not be VCC over RC, and this might not be VCC. In other circuits, as I said, um, you're going to see other changes. It will always be the case that VC is equal to VCE. And here's a common thing. Here's a very common error. People screw up on this. VC is not the same as V of RC. We're even going to make that pseudo 3D. It's so important. VC is the voltage from collector to ground. Remember, single subscripts mean from that point to ground. So here's the collector, C. So if you're going to measure VC with a meter, one lead goes to the collector, one lead goes to ground. Right? Your common point. So that's VC. V of RC is across the resistor. All right, so you get one lead here and you got one lead here. Two different things. Again, variations from circuit to circuit to circuit. Do not try to memorize formulas for all these different circuits we're going to look at. It's always going to work back to Ohm's Law, KVL. And sometimes, you know, we'll, uh, we'll piggyback on KCL as well. But those are the keys right there. One of the issues that we have that we're going to look at in the next video is how to deal with the fact that beta does change. You know, I don't usually like to see this kind of a change. You know, 4.65 mils. 9.3 mils. I would actually like to have a situation where the Q point is pretty much always the same, regardless of what happens to the beta. There are good reasons for that, and we'll pick that up next time.